good afternoon today uh, we are going to talk about the regional trade agreements and how do we evaluate the regional trade agreements now these regional trade agreements are allowed under the article 24 of the wto provision and uh, and the reason um, they allow it is they believe that regional trade organizations will be a stepping stone towards multilateral liberalization now what it means is that generally there is a belief that if a group of countries form an economic grouping uh, they would have a free trade among themselves and in that manner they can discriminate against the uh, non regional trading partners so from 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 outside it looks that rtas are discriminatory in nature but the belief in wto is according to article 24 is that it will be a stepping stone towards multilateral liberalization it will it will not discriminate against the non regional trading partners so the bone of contention is that article 24 of the wto now you have seen that all these rtas have sprouted all over if you see india's if you go to ministry of commerce and look at uh, india's participation in these regional trade agreements you will see that india participates in many many of these india is trying to align with asean countries the east asian grouping of 11 trading partners india is trying to align with uh, the gcc the gulf cooperation council uh, which is the gulf countries india is trying to align with australia it india is trying to align with japan south korea shanghai cooperation the cis republics india is going to is is eager to have a tie up with the south africans with the brazilians with the russians with the chinese so uh, uh, you you have so many of these regional trade agreements coming in now the problem comes is say for example uh if chinese decides to enter the canadian market and uh canada us and mexico have a free trade agreement and yet the tariffs that they impose on uh, non regional trading partners are different now if you have a free trade area among three of you and i know that uh canada has the highest tariffs uh us is in middle and mexico has the lowest tariffs then what i will do as chinese is that i will put my product in mexico and i will hope that because of this free trade area my product will flow in into into canada so i will use that route to reach Can uh, canada otherwise if i have to enter canada i i have the tariffs which are imposed on my products are much higher then the entry via my via mexico so these are some sort of uh, discrimination uh, discriminatory type of things which can happen and so all these rules of origin have come up where you need to uh, you, you 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 need to uh, decide on the the products which are emanating out of one country so so then the rules of origin are uh, are very extensive and so so then uh, in nafta the discussion is all about that if the chinese products have entered the mexican market then it has to have a substantial american content to enter the canadian market so the whole set of rules of origin is about changing the entire product chinese product and making it american for Amer americanized so that the the products can easily flow in in the other countries so you have a whole lot of issues uh, regarding regarding this in india also uh, you have a south asian free trade area which has come up in 2006 but the but so you have a free trade area among eight countries but then each country maintains different tariff rates for the regional trading part so if someone wants to provide vanaspati oil and it sees that the indian markets are charging very high tariffs it will enter through sri lanka 
and because sri lanka india have a free trade area it 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 reaches india through that route so we are at loss because our producers are getting affected we had maintained certain tariffs sri lankans had another set of tariffs so then you move so so you have these different levels of economic integration you have a preferential trading agreement you have a free trade area then you have a customs union where you have a common external tariff for all the regional members so the first level is a preferential trading arrangement where if five partners come together then they will say okay we'll provide some relief on products which are coming from the uh, regional regional trading partners some tariff relief some lower customs duty then you have free trade area where you have zero tariffs for all products uh, uh, originating in in the block then you have a a customs union where you have a common external tariff for all the regional for for all the non members so you have free you have preferential trading you have free trade you have customs union the different levels of economic integration then you have a common market where there is free flow of goods as well as services as well as factors of production so it's not only free flow of goods and services it's free flow of factors of production so uh, say for example mercosur the the south american regional grouping is is a customs union and it's trying it the talks are going on to move it from to move from customs union to the common market there's another grouping small grouping called the andean community that's like a common market is not only free flow of goods and services but you have free flow of factors of production and the highest form and the highest uh, form you have a question no. you ha uh, is the highest form of integration is what we have seen in europe it's called the economic union where you not only have free flow of goods and services and factors of production but one common policy for uh, for 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 all aspects relating to economy relating to society re relating to finance relating to banks and then you have a common currency you have one central bank you have one parliament can you believe it one parliament for the entire group so one political policy for all one central bank one common currency and besides free flow of goods and services and factors of production that's the highest for the south asians are at that stage safta south asia free trade association so after this it's customs union then it's common market then it's economic union so then uh, 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 jagdish bhagwati uh, the, the indian professor who's, who's worked extensively on international trade especially on trade policy issues he says that this is like a spaghetti bowl because you don't know the product which is which you are consuming is is really from china or is it from some other country because um, there are so many these uh, regional trade organizations which have sprouted all over so then the question is how to evaluate these regional trade agreements is it better for india to align with asean or is it better for india to align with europe okay now uh, one would think if you ask a common man he'll say europeans are richer probably it's better that we align with europe but things if you evaluate then you have to evaluate it on certain parameters right now given the things that we have learned where we have seen that if you reduce tariffs or if you uh, increase export subsidies it tends to have an impact on the terms of trade it will have an impact on consumer surplus producer surplus and then there will be a net welfare effect 
So, then um, there uh, to evaluate these regional agreements, it was way back in 1950s that Professor Weiner, Jacob Weiner introduced two terms called trade creation and trade diversion. Now, these two terms are used extensively for evaluating the regional trade agreements. So, uh, uh, regional trade agreement um, is evaluated traditionally by working out the trade creation and the trade diversion. Trade creation is always welfare increasing, it will always incre lead to increase in welfare. Uh, trade diversion most of the time is welfare reducing, but in some cases it can increase welfare. Now, I will explain the concept of trade creation and trade diversion by giving you an example. Now, trade creation is when the domestic production is substituted by imports from the regional trading partners. So, it is substituted instead of producing the same product at home it is now imported at a lower cost from the trading partners. That is like trade creation. So, earlier you were producing at home at some cost. Now, because of the formation of a regional trading block, you can import the same product from a member country at a lower cost. That is trade creation. What is trade diversion? If there is a diversion of trade from non-member to member country, that is called trade diversion. So, you have to evaluate a regional trade agreement by working out trade creation and trade diversion. So, I am going to the board and giving you an example, so that you will be a better able to understand what this, uh, uh, what is this concept of trade creation. and trade diversion. 
Okay, so uh, this is a table wherein uh, the Mexicans and the Japanese are interested in providing cars to the US market and we have a scenario, we have a scenario of uh, such imports taking place before the formation of a North American free trade area that is before 94 and post 94 scenario. Asians are the most efficient producers, Japanese are the most efficient producers, maybe now it is the Chinese for various reasons. So, if the imports come from Ch Asia before 1994 and there is a 0% tariff, it costs dollar $19, 10% $21.90, 20% $22.80. If it is coming from Mexico, 20 here, 22 and 24. And if you produce the same cars in US, it will cost you $1.22. Now, start with a scenario where you impose 20 percent tariffs. U means the US imposed 20 percent tariffs. So, you have to look at this column. Now, if you had imported the cars from Mexico and Asia, it would have cost the US $1.24 and $1.22.80. But the local production takes place at dollar twenty-two. So then, before nineteen ninety-four, it is wise for the U.S. to produce the same car locally. Now see what happens after ninety-four, post NAFTA. Then you form a free trade association: Americans, the Canadians, and the Mexicans. Now you can import the same product at dollar 20 from mexico from mexico so then see what happens the domestic production is now substituted by cheaper imports from the member countries now you can import the same car from mexico at dollar 20 so who is gaining the consumers are gaining here because now they can get the product at dollar 20 Mexicans are gaining because now they can provide, they can, they can, they can come in and provide the cars to the, to the US market. Asians are not affected because in any way earlier uh, the cars were produced in US, they were not affected, they were out of the market. So, after NAFTA, the, the production instead of producing the same cars at home, it is now imported from Mexico. So, consumers gain right, and the producers in Mexico gain because now they can provide the same product in the US market. This is scenario when, when you have a 20 percent, when you have a 20 percent tariff, look at what happens if there is a 10 percent tariff. If there is a 10 percent tariff, if you import from Mexico, you are charged $1.22 for the, con the consumer uh, will get a car at $1.22 from Asia $21.90. This is before NAFTA. So, before NAFTA, this is the scenario. Now, you can easily see that before NAFTA, it is wise for the Americans to import the same car from from the Asians, right? This is before NAFTA. What is interesting is what happens after the formation of NAFTA. After the formation of NAFTA, because of the free trade area, now you can get the same car from Mexico at dollar twenty. So the so there is a diversion of trade from non-member to member country. Instead of importing it from Japan or China, it is better to import it from Mexico. So, what is the gain? The gain is one minute, it is there will be a, a, a small change, uh, it is 10 percent.
it is 20.90, sorry, 20.90, please correct this 10 percent, 10 percent of 19 is 20.90, right, please correct this. In any case, this will not change the scenario, dollar 20.90. Now, see what happens, now you can import the same car at dollar 20 from Mexico. So, the gain is, gain for the consumers is 90 cents, right, but then the government, the US government loses 1.90 as tariff revenue. Why? because now uh, it is a free trade area, there are no tariffs which are charged. So, the net effect is loss of 1.90, but a gain of 90 uh, cents for the Americans. So, net effect of uh, a trade diversion is negative in this example, right. So, trade creation is always welfare improving trade diversion most of the time is welfare reducing. So, you can see uh, consumers gain, gain 90 cents, but the US government loses revenue of dollar 1.90. So, please you have to change this figure also, it is 20.90, please correct this, scenario will remain the same. The idea is trade creation is welfare improving, trade diversion is welfare reducing. Now, I am going to go to a figure and put through the, the same idea uh, and we will see the net effect of, uh, of forming a regional trade agreement. So, I have the same, I will go and draw the same diagram this will be US, I will have a demand curve, I will have an export supply curve, right. And I will consider two countries now, I will consider Mexico, I will consider the Asians, right. So, I will have imports here and I will have price. I have the demand curve, uh, the, the import, uh, the demand curve of US and I have an export supply curve, which I call as P Asia. I will have an export supply curve, which will shift because of the tariffs. Okay, now, you need to understand this diagram. Again, I am uh, talking of a country US, which is small in context of the Asian producers providing these cars. 
because there's Chinese, there are Japanese, there are other people who are providing these cars. So, the supply curve that it faces is perfectly horizontal. Remember, if it was a small country, the export supply curve that it faces is perfectly horizontal. Why? Because if the foreigners, if the foreigners try to increase the price, nobody will buy it from them. Reason? There are so many of them who are providing these cars to the US. And because perfect competi competition prevails, so uh, this line is also the average revenue, the demand curve for each perfect competitive producer. Can you recall that particular thing that when you have a small country, you had uh, a demand curve and then you had this export supply curve, which was, which was uh, horizontal and that was interpreted by producers as their demand curve. Because remember, in perfect competition, each one is a price taker. So, in context of Asia, this is the supply curve. In context of Mexico, it is a large country, so it faces an upward sloping supply curve. Now, think of a scenario when tariffs are imposed. When tariffs are imposed, so, remember what happens if tariffs are imposed, it is interpreted as a leftward shift of the supply curve or here in case an upward shift of the supply curve, an upward shift of the supply curve. So, the scenario is that when tariffs are imposed, tariffs are imposed, the equilibrium is here at point C. Out of OQ3 of imports, OQ1 is provided by the Mexicans. The rest of the cars come from, come from Asia. This is the scenario before the formation of a free trade area or a regional trade agreement. Now, see what happens. Now, uh, there is a free trade agri agreement. So, the supply curve shifts to the right, because there are no tariffs now, at least for the Mexicans, not for the Asians. For Asians, the tariffs remain the same. So, then because of the free trade area, the Mexicans now provide more of cars from OQ1 to OQ2. Asians provide less of it, Q2, Q3. The, the gain in producer surplus is A plus B for the Mexicans. This is for the Mexicans. The loss in government revenue because of the formation of a free trade area is A, B and C, right. Because remember, this was the tariffs for this much of imports. This is the loss in revenue, loss in government revenue for US. So, the net welfare effect, the net welfare effect of the entire NAFTA agreement is minus c. Why? How do you interpret it? It is interpreted in the same way as those minus b plus d, the dead weight loss, the efficiency loss. And this is happening because, now please concentrate here. The most efficient producers are the Asians. Still, you are uh, dispensing them out because you formed a free trade area and the production is diverted from the efficient producers to a member nation. And that is where you have this efficiency loss, that is captured by this minus c term. Okay? 
So, trade diversion most of the time is welfare reducing. So, if you have to evaluate a SARC or a SAFTA, you have to work out trade creation, you have to work out trade diversion. Now, for that you have econometric methodologies, you have you have a smart analysis, single market partial equilibrium analysis, uh, because remember when you are when you are working out trade creation, it is domestic production which is substituted by cheaper imports from the member country. So, you need to have a, some demand function and you need to work out the elasticities, then only you will be able to work out trade creation. So, uh, this is a, uh, a neat theoretical const construct of the fact that trade diversion is most of the time welfare reducing. Now, see what happens, one exception is the case where trade diversion can be potentially welfare increasing. How? If the Mexicans become very, ex very excited about the fact that now they are doing business with the US and they increase the production to that extent that all the requirements of US are now met by the Mexicans. So, their production increases from here to this level. Now, this is where whatever were their imports, this has been provided by whatever was their demand, it has been met by the supply by the Mexicans. Okay. Now, then what happens then? What is the net effect? The net effect is that the consumers gain because there is a gain in consumer surplus, this is in dynamic sense, trade diversion is welfare improving, so the, the gain in consumer surplus A plus B plus C plus D plus E loss in government revenue A plus B plus C plus D. So, the net welfare positive So, there is a negative sign here minus a, please do not miss minus a minus b minus c minus d plus a plus b plus c plus d plus e. So, the net welfare for us works out to be e. It is only in this case that the us can gain because the Mexicans are now providing the entire production. Uh, under the free trade area. So, the net welfare effect is, is positive. Okay. So, this is the, the uh, a theoretical construct of, uh, uh, this is uh, the concept of trade creation and trade diversion. Now, uh, how do we, so if it is a real data situation, if say uh, you want to evaluate whether India is better off by aligning with either the ASEAN or the Europeans or the Latin Americans or the South Africans then you need to work out both trade creation and trade diversion. Yeah. So, uh, 
So, we will talk about those models uh, tomorrow, we will talk about the smart analysis, we will talk about the gravity analysis, how trade creation and trade diversion uh, can be worked out, some figures can come. Once the figures are there, then you can evaluate whether regional trade agreements are beneficial for you or, or not. So, we will carry on this tomorrow, thank you.